Thanks to Shaper 3D for sponsoring this video. What's going on guys? Today we're going to discuss a little bit about the differences between direct modeling and parametric modeling. And also we'll take a look at the power of using the design history within Shaper 3D. And since we'll be doing a little bit of modeling today, feel free to follow along using the free version of Shaper 3D. Or if you feel like upgrading to the pro version and unlocking all of the great features it has to offer, you can use my code Beverage Creations 10 and save 10%. But really, it doesn't matter which version you're using, you can follow along with today's tutorial no problems. Um, okay, so just a little bit of history, no pun intended, Shaper 3D did start out as a direct modeling program. And what that means is just think of it as modeling with a piece of clay. We simply push and pull geometry until we get the shape we want, which is pretty much what we've been doing up to this point in our tutorial. It's super intuitive and straightforward to do, right? And what we haven't talked about up to this point is the parametric modeling side of things in Shaper 3D, which can be accessed by clicking this little clock icon that you see right here. Um, okay, so right now I have this castle joint, which we finished up at the end of our last tutorial. And if you recall, we created this part or assembly just by pushing and pulling some sketches and then using the subtract tool to cut the joinery, right? And now if we click over here and open up our history sidebar, you can see that we've got a list of things here in this tree. And if we just quickly scroll through this, you can see that basically anytime we made a change, it added a step in this tree that follows how this part or or this assembly was modeled in chronological order. And we can also expand any of these steps and edit the parameters that created each step. So let's say that we go to this first extrusion, you can see that we can edit the distance or the length of this extrusion. So it says 700, so we can change that to negative 1000 instead, and it changes the length to 1000. Um, yeah, so you might be wondering like, why would I want to do that if I can just simply, you know, come in here and grab the surface and, you know, change that that way? Well, <laughs> You know, you're not wrong, we could totally do that, which is why I think a better way to explain the differences between direct modeling and parametric modeling is just create a new model and show you the differences. So let's uh, go ahead and create a new simple part. Um, let's go ahead and uh, go to our dashboard and let's uh, click on this plus sign to create a new project. So let's uh, go through the settings real quick. As for units, I have mine set to millimeters and I'm gonna lock my grid size to one millimeter. It's just something I like to do. Um, yeah, let's see what else. So for snap two, I have everything turned on and I think that's pretty much it. Let's go ahead and go to a top view. I'm gonna close the items manager for now. I don't think we need that. So yeah, let's uh, zoom out real quick. And I'm gonna go to the sketch toolbar and select a diagonal rectangle. I'm just gonna quickly draw something random. And let's set that to 400 millimeters wide by 200 millimeters tall. And we're gonna switch over to the line tool. And I'm just gonna draw a line somewhere like that. And let's zoom in here. Hold down the shift key so we're picking this point and this point and we're just going to set some dimensions. So let's put down 75 right there. Once again, these are just random numbers, so just the closest values. And then let's uh, spin out of this view and we're going to pick... Oops, I think this point is not laying on that line. So I'm going to grab that point and make sure that's actually laying on that line. There we go. My bad. Okay, I'm just going to pick this surface right here, and I'm going to extrude that up 25 millimeters. So we got just a random shape like that. And then let's uh, pick these three corners here, and let's pull to round them over, and let's try 70 millimeters. Okay, let's uh, round over these two corners. So yeah, I'm just doing something to create as many steps as I can, just so that we can have a bunch of steps within our history sidebar later. That's really all I'm trying to do right now. And let's do 80 millimeters. Okay, now let's uh, start another sketch on this top surface. So select that surface and then create another sketch. And then we're gonna use the line tool and we're gonna kind of follow the profile of what we already have. 
So a horizontal line, and then a vertical line, and then some random line at an angle, a horizontal line, and then yeah, a vertical line. So we want to make sure that this line is vertical. So this is a good opportunity for me to show you the uh, constraints are over here on the right side. So we're not sure if this line is actually vertical or not. Let's say this line was kind of at an angle and we want to make sure that this line is vertical. So if we want to do that, you know, we want to select this line and come over here and this set of icons on the right here are constraints for our sketches. So we want to select this icon right here that says horizontal vertical. So once we pick it, it'll snap this line to vertical. So that's one of those smart features that Shaper 3D has. It sees that line as being pretty close to vertical. So once you select it, it just snaps it to vertical. Okay, so now that we have that constraint there, we know that line is perfectly vertical. Um, okay, let's hold down the shift key and we wanna pick that line and the edge of our base. And let's set that distance to 40 millimeters. And now let's do the same to this bottom edge and the bottom edge of our base. And let's set that to 50 millimeters. Um, let's do the top edges. Let's do 30 for the top. And let's do the right side. Let's do 90. All right, let's spin out of that view. Let's extrude that up. Let's do 15. Mm, yeah, once again, let's put some roundovers um, for these two left corners. Let's do. Let's go with uh, 35 millimeters. For this bottom corner here, let's do something big. Let's go with like 100 millimeters. And then these two right corners, see it looks good. Yeah, 30 millimeters look good. Um, yeah, I still don't know what this is, but let's say that our client came to us and they say we want an extrusion right here, like a circular extrusion. So let's start another sketch on that surface right here. And we wanna put a circular extrusion right here. I think actually 40 millimeters is pretty good in diameter. And let's make that distance oh, 35 millimeters. Um, actually, let's draw another circle on the inside of that. And let's set that diameter to 35. Okay, let's spin out of that and let's go ahead and extrude this guy up to create a cylinder. And let's do the same height as the extrusion that we have over here, which was 15 millimeters. Something like that. Um, and let's look down the barrel and we're gonna pick that surface and we're gonna push it down so we create a hole. So maybe, you know, this is something like, you know, we mount something and then we bolt it through. Yeah, you know, while we're here, maybe we want to create a few more bolt holes on this surface as well. So let's uh, go ahead and sketch a few more holes on this surface too. So let's sketch a few random circles. Um, let's do, I don't know, 40 millimeters. Do 35 and then 30, sure, why not? And we'll set some distances from this edge to this edge. Let's do 40, set some good clearances. All right, something like that. And then let's pick these holes and we'll push them through to cut them out. And lastly, let's do some round overs. So let's select the top edges of the base and this top edge here, and let's do five millimeters. And then we'll do say 10 millimeters here. And then maybe we can do some chamfers along the inside of the holes, even this one here. So to do chamfers, we can just select the edge and then instead of pulling to do the roundovers, we push in to do the chamfer. So we want to push into it. 
Yeah, so yeah, maybe just one millimeter is fine. That looks pretty good. Actually, no, let's do two millimeters. Oof, no, 1.5. That looks good. You know, this actually looks like a legit part. <laughs> All right, so we've got this part modeled for our client. It fits their spec perfectly. Everything's great. They're happy. They're gonna pay us. No changes, right? <laughs> Well, if you ever worked with clients before in any kind of design projects, you know what's coming next. They're gonna make big changes. So in the case of direct modeling, you're pretty much stuck with what you have. Okay, okay, so you can make some changes, but you're more than likely have to delete and remake a bunch of stuff. Um, so let's say our client comes back and goes, with the next gen upgrade, we are reducing the total size of our product. This part needs to be 380 millimeters wide instead of 400 millimeters wide, but the position of this mounting hole here has to scale with it. Because that is usually what happens. Well, with direct modeling, all we can really do is grab that surface and push that in 20 millimeters, so 380. So, not bad. Now let's try to do that with this feature here. Oh, 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 where did it go? Oh, you mean it doesn't work? Yeah, so all we can do is basically delete that guy, fill this hole in, and then redo all of that stuff. You know, redraw that and then recreate that extrusion and then recut the hole. It'll take you an extra, like, what, five minutes? So with this example, not that bad. But, you know, if you have something really complex, it can take hours, days. So let's undo that. Luckily with history-based parametric modeling in Shaper 3D, it makes it much, much easier. So let's open up our history sidebar here and all we need to do is go to our first sketch, click on that, and change that value from 400 to 380. And you see how that shifted with it. It changed the width of our part and shifted that along with it because we had to find that position in this sketch earlier, saying that this entire feature needs to remain, what, 35 millimeters from this edge at all times. So basically, that's what happened. Um, and also, I noticed that when I made that change, this hole also changed because I think that the definition of this hole yeah, it also depends on this edge right here. So, so that's why when we changed this sketch to 380 millimeters, it shifted this hole as well. So we can change that pretty easily. We can just change that to 100 millimeters and that hole changes back to its original position. So yeah, as you can see, basically with parametric modeling or history-based parametric modeling, or whatever you want to call it, everything's controlled by constraints, features, or mathematical formulas, you know, things like that. It makes it really robust when you have to make changes like this. Um, yeah, just another great example using this you know, random part that I just kind of made up on the spot. Let's say that the part that we're mounting to our part here, um, instead of 15 millimeters from the surface here, we're moving it 25 millimeters away from the surface. So basically we need to move the surface 10 more millimeters away. Um, if we're using direct modeling, we're stuck with the round over sizes, right? So we wanna just grab the surface and we wanna pull that up 10 millimeters. So let's see what happens. So from 40, we wanna increase that to 50 millimeters. That ain't even working, guys. <laughs> what is that shape? Like, that's not even manufacturable. You can't even do that. That's a, that's an undercut. You can't even, you can't even make that in a die. <laughs> like, at this point, you need to scrap this entire model and remake it. You can't even do this. Um, yeah, let's undo that and see if we can update that using the history sidebar. So in our extrusion, let's change that to 25. Yeah, there we go. You know, it works with parametric modeling because we're changing it in this step before any of these roundovers was even applied. Um, actually, this just reminded me of another cool thing that we can do with extrusions inside of Shaper 3D. So let's undo that real quick. So in Shaper 3D, um, we can actually define the depth of the extrusions 
based on other features inside of the model. And just to make this easier for direct modeling, let's say our client came back and says, this top mounting surface has to be 10 millimeters from this bottom surface. So basically we have to reduce the top mounting surface by five millimeters, right? Um, so let's grab this top mounting surface and hold down the shift key as well, because we're gonna do the same thing to this surface as well. Because remember the part needs to sit on this top surface as well as this surface, right? So with direct modeling, we need to select this surface, hold down the shift key, and then also select this surface as well, right? And then we're just gonna push this down five millimeters. So minus five. Yeah, there we go. Worked pretty well. It got rid of the chamfers, but you know, whatever. We're gonna fix that later. So with direct modeling, that's a pretty quick fix. Not bad. But with parametric modeling in Shaper 3D, let's undo that real quick. What we can do is, let's find the extrusion responsible for this guy here. It is this one right here. And expand that. And if we come to extend right here, and in the drop down menu next to it, and if we select to object, and then right here it says fix, let's click on that. And it's gonna ask us what we want to select the to object as. And we wanna pick the top surface of this guy right here. So once we pick that and then click done, we just told the program to always extend this extrusion up to this surface. So let's see what happened. Now, if I go to this extrusion and let's say if our client, let's go to a side view so you can see this easier. If our client comes to us and say, I want to change that to 10 millimeters. Can you see that? That changed along with it. If our clients comes to say, we want to change that to 30 millimeters, that changed with it again. So now we just define our part in such a way that no matter what request our client comes to us with, or at least you know this type of request, like the position of the mating part, all of our mating surfaces are gonna update to it at the same time with one single input. And there's no need to hold down the shift key and making sure that you've selected all the correct surfaces and you didn't miss anything. You know, that is the beauty of using the history-based parametric modeling inside of Shaper 3D. Pretty cool, right? Um, yeah, so I hope this video gave you a little bit of insight about the differences between direct modeling and the history-based parametric modeling inside Shaper 3D and the pros and cons about each. And also just so you know, you're not stuck with parametric modeling just because they added this feature inside the program. You can totally choose to ignore that little clock icon if you want to and just keep using Shaper 3D as a direct modeling program. And in fact, you can even mix the two if you want throughout a single project and that that is actually how I use the program for my own projects. Um, anyway, I hope you guys liked the video, and if you did, be sure to leave me one of these and let me know in the comments, and I hope to see you guys in the next video.